Good afternoon and good morning to those of you who are joining us from the West Coast. This is Warren Kurtzman at Coleman Insights. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon. I'll be joined in just a couple of minutes by my colleagues, John Boyne and Sam Milkman. And today we're gonna to present to you the results of our study, which we call our Contemporary Music Super Study, which we fielded in the first quarter of this year. Uh, we initially presented the top line findings of this study at the Worldwide Radio Seminar last month in Hollywood. And today we're gonna share a lot of the same information that we presented at the Worldwide Radio Summit, but we're also gonna go a little bit more in depth in a couple of key areas. So let me tell you a little bit about the Contemporary Music Super Study in some more detail. This is a study based on the FACT 360 strategic music test methodology that Coleman Insights uses for hundreds of radio stations around the world. FACT 360 is our library music testing service. And most of the time when we're doing a FACT 360 study for one of our clients, usually the study is pretty focused. And what I mean by that is that it's generally focused on a narrow demographic range, usually somewhere between 10 and 20 years. It's often done with just one gender versus another. Sometimes it's particularly focused on a specific ethnic group or a non-ethnic group. Um, and we also tend to do these studies with very focused music lists. The songs that we're testing tend to be very specific to the format of the station that we're doing the research for. Now, we did some things that are a little bit different with this study, and I'm going to share with you our approach, which is kind of different from the typical FACT 360 study that we would do for an individual radio station. Uh, most noteworthy is the target sample that we used for this study. We did a very broad study. A thousand respondents between the ages of 12 and 54 all across the United States and Canada. Now we put controls in place to make sure that we got a good representation of the population of the two countries in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, and geography. But this is a much broader look at music than you'd ever see when you are looking at the results of an individual station's FACT 360 study. The other thing that's very different about this study is how we built the list of songs that we tested. Typically, when we're doing a study for a specific radio station, we're looking at music that that station plays and that music that is played on other stations and following similar strategies often play as well. So it tends to be a study that'll be country music or hip hop or pop, etc. Well, this time we took a very different approach. Thanks to the help of our friends over at BDS Radio and Nielsen Music, we put together a list of what is essentially the most consumed songs from the year 2018. And the way we did that is from Nielsen Music, we were able to get data about 2018's most consumed songs in terms of streaming, in terms of sales, and in terms of radio airplay. So when we built this list, that's where we started. We said, let's take a look at the songs that were most heavily consumed in 2018. Now, we also supplemented that list by taking a look at the six genres of music that were getting the most exposure. And we wanted to make sure that we got the top songs from each of those genres included in the list as well. Um, now, one other editorial decision we made is that we excluded from the list any songs that were more than five years old. And the reality is there was only one song that fit that criteria. It was Bohemian Rhapsody uh, from Queen, not surprising given the success of the movie last year. So with all due respect to Freddie Mercury, or in this case, Remy Malek as Freddie Mercury, uh, we did not include that song in the list. But overall, this test list was based on the songs that Americans and Canadians consumed the most in 2018. And as a result, it's very important for us to make a distinction here. We are not calling this the new music super study. It's not just songs that were released in 2018. It's a contemporary music super study. It's the songs that were consumed the most in 2018. And that does include a fair number of songs from 2017, 2016, 2015, and 2014. So it's very important to keep that in mind. This is not just focused on new music. Instead, it's a contemporary music super study. Now, when our respondents participated in this study, we had them follow the methodology that we typically use with our FACT 360 studies. Whereas they heard each hook, they were asked a couple of questions. 
The first question they were asked was whether or not they were familiar with the song we presented to them. And then if and only if they were familiar with the song, we then had them rate the song on a scale of one to five, five being songs that they like a lot, one being songs that they dislike a lot, and of course, two, three, and four in the middle. Now, when John and Sam start sharing some data with you in a couple of minutes, there's a couple of different ways that we're going to look at this song data. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at just the percentage of respondents in the study who gave a song a five, a like a lot score. And we're going to call those like a lot scores. These are scores that really tell you about the passion level that exists for specific titles that we tested in the study. But for most of the presentation today, we're going to focus on what we call an evaluation average score. The evaluation average score is based on a weighted average of how respondents rated all of the songs across this one to five scale. So that's a little bit about how we actually did the study and the approach that we took. Now I'm going to turn things over to John Boyne and he's going to start sharing with you some of the key results of our study. So we coded every song that was tested with a genre code that reflects coding that is used by Nielsen Music BDS Radio. And it's first interesting to look at the genre distribution of our test list built off the most consumed titles of last year. You'll see that a third of the titles tested are in the hip hop and R&B genre, which is reflective of that being a very high, highly consumed genre last year. One in three of the titles tested are in the hip hop and R&B genre. It's also interesting to note that um, a lot of those hip hop and R&B titles came from digital consumption metrics rather than radio consumption metrics. Whereas the second category of our test, country, which accounts for 21% of the titles tested, leans the other way. A lot of those titles were more driven by radio consumption versus digital consumption. And we'll be digging into that a little bit further as we, as, as we get through a few points in this study. Also at about that 20% level is pop. That material accounts for 19% of all songs tested. And then the latter three categories fall in a lower tier. Uh, dance Electronic accounts for 10% of titles tested, Alternative Rock, 9% of titles tested, and Latin, 9% of titles tested. So that's what's tested based on what was consumed last year. Now, we're interested, though, in what tests best. We're interested in the top tier of performance. And as Warren just described a minute ago, we're going to look at this in two measurement dimensions. The first is what we call like a lot scores. So here would be the top tier, the top 100 titles uh, in terms of their like a lot scores, which you can really think of as passion. Uh, first, you'll see that hip hop and R&B accounts for 35% of the top 100 like a lot titles. And right behind it is pop. And notice the difference between the two bars for pop. Pop accounts for 19% of the test list, but a third of the top 100 titles based on like a lot scores. So we consider that a strong overperformance of the pop genre. Uh, pop is popular. Then beneath those two genres, you've got country, alternative rock, dance, and a little bit of Latin. It's important to note uh, with Latin, as you'll see later on throughout the, uh, the presentation, Though there's a fan base for Latin titles, outside of that core fan base, uh, there isn't much interest. And so that tends to limit the performance of Latin based on just the lack of crossover into other genre fans. Now, a second way of looking at music scoring is the evaluation average that was described earlier. This again is the full spectrum of how people look, rate the music. Whereas like a lot is just looking at the passion level for material evaluation average looks at everyone. How does everyone feel about it? Whether they like it or dislike it, it takes all of that into account. And you, so you can really think about evaluation as mass appeal of a song. What's the, the mass interest level? When we look at the top 100 titles on an evaluation average basis, we see some differences. 
First, you'll see pop rises up even stronger, accounting for 42% of the top 100 titles. So really strong overperformance of pop material. You'll also notice that hip hop and R&B comes down as we transition from the like a lot passion measurement to the kind of broad appeal evaluation average, average measurement. And what's that? what that is indicating to us is that while there are a lot of people who really love a lot of hip hop and R&B titles, the flip side of that is that there are a lot of people who really don't care for that material. Uh, not necessarily in the middle, lukewarm, but don't like it. And so that, that, that pulls down hip hop and R&B. That's a polarity, high passion on one end, high negativity on the other, pulls down the performance of hip hop and R&B from a mass appeal evaluation standpoint though still comes in as the second best genre in this regard. Then you've got country at 15%, alternative rock at 12, dance electronic at 11, and no Latin titles made it into the top 100 on an evaluation average basis. Now, we'll be diving deep into these different genres and looking at them a lot of different ways, but before I do, uh, uh, wanted to turn over to ERA for a moment. Um, this is the era composition of the test list. So 49% of all songs tested were from 2018, 43% from 2017, and then smaller percentages for 16, 15, and 14. Because again, this wasn't a test of brand new music. It wasn't a test of titles that were released last year. It was a test of the most consumed titles of last year. And then for comparison, what are the top 100 titles look like in terms of era distribution. And you'll see that there is a little bit of an older lean to the tastes here. Um, not overwhelmingly, but uh, relative to their share of the test list, you see more 2016 titles breaking through to the top 100, even a few 2014 titles breaking through into the top 100. Though, big picture, the vast majority of titles in the top 100 are from 2017 and 2018. So let's dive deeper into the different genres assessed in this study. Uh, we were able to uh, measure how everyone feels about different genres, and then we can drill into those fan bases. And that's what we'll do here. We'll go one by one through the key music genres and learn a little bit more about the best testing titles from those genres, as well as how fans of those genres feel about the music. We'll start with hip hop and R&B. Again, as a baseline, I'm going to leave in this green set of bars, which represents the genre distribution of all songs tested. That's the baseline. Now I'm going to layer in the top 100 titles among hip hop and R&B fans. So we're zeroing in on that fan base. What do hip hop and R&B fans like best? Well, no surprise, you see a lot of hip hop and R&B. They're that genre accounts for 63 of the top 100 titles with hip hop and R&B fans. And you'll note that's roughly a two to one overperformance relative to that genre share of the test list. That two to one performance dimension is gonna be repeated as we dig into the other formats. You'll see that pattern play out elsewhere. Now what's really interesting in these slides is that then go next and see, well, what else do genre fans like? So in the case of hip hop and R&B, the second best genre is pop. In fact, pop overperforms relative to its share of the test list. So 29% of the top titles with hip hop and R&B fans are indeed coded as pop. And that too is a pattern you'll see play out across subsequent genre uh, uh, data. We'll see that pop does well overall because it tends to be the second best genre among uh, format category fans. Whereas notice country has just as big, actually a slightly bigger share of the test list than pop, but among hip hop and R&B fans, there's only one country title. And that's indicating that country is not compatible, generally speaking, with the hip hop and R&B appetite, but pop sure is. So I said we would drill down and show you the best songs from each genre. That's what we'll do here. So first, here are the top titles that are coded as hip hop and R&B, the top hip hop and R&B titles in the overall uh, uh, sample of listeners. Pray For Me is the number one hip hop and R&B coded title. Love Lies is the second. 
1-800-273-8255 is the third. Then you've got Redbone and Better Now. That's the top five of the material coded to this genre. Now, you may also wonder, well, what about fans of hip hop and R&B? Do they like, like the same titles? That list on the left is pretty poppy. Um, how do fans of hip hop and R&B feel? Well, here's their top five. It is a little bit different. I think you could look at this and say it's a little pure, uh, 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 not quite as crossover. So God's Plan, Better Now, Humble, Rockstar, and Love Lies. Next, we'll turn our attention to country. Uh, this again in green is the baseline distribution of all songs tested. But now let's look at the top 100 among country fans. Sure enough, a lot of country titles break into the top 100 country fans, 55% of the top 100 there. Um, I told you the you know, general baseline we see is a two to one overperformance of a genre among its core fans. Here you see uh, a bit better than that. It's actually a 2.6 to one overperformance. So among the country fans, um, there's really intense interest in country material, more than you see in the other genres. Secondarily among country fans, pop emerges with 28% of the top 100 titles. And then again, noteworthy that hip hop accounts for a third of the test list, but only four of the top 100 titles with country fans. It's a big genre, but um, not particularly compatible with the typical country fan. What are the top five titles that are coded as country? Here they are. The number one is a real crossover title that a lot of you will recognize, certainly bleeds into the pop world, uh, meant to be. Then Tennessee Whiskey, Small Town Boy, Body Like a Back Road, and Heaven. If we zero in on country fans, what were their uh, uh, most popular country titles? It's, it's a number of the same titles, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that meant to be the number one country coded song in the total audience um, isn't on the in the top five on the right. Now, does that mean that this pop crossover country title really tanked with pure country fans? No, it showed up at number nine. So not in the top five, but it did make the top 10 with country fans. More interesting though, is number two, Tennessee Whiskey. Tennessee Whiskey was the number two evaluated country song, but among country format fans, it was 53rd. That is indicating that the fan base for Tennessee Whiskey isn't quite in the kind of normal, quote unquote, normal country fan base, uh, but it pulls uh, uh, interest from other places as well. Next, we'll turn to pop. Among pop fans, pop coded material accounts for 44% of the top 100 titles. Again, uh, uh, roughly two to one, better than two to one over performance of that genre among its core fans. Now beyond pop, you'll see there's hip hop and R&B, there's some country, there's some dance, there's some alternative rock music among the top 100 with pop fans. Pop is really the center lane um, kind of the midpoint of everything. And so secondary performance of titles blurs and, and is spread out, I should say, among various genres. If we zero in just on the pop coded material, here are the top five titles. Number one is Uptown Funk. That's a good example of a title that's a few years old, but still has a lot of appeal and, and of course was among the most consumed titles of last year. Then Shape of You, Thinking Out Loud, so two Ed Sheerans, There's Nothing Holding Me Back, and Scars to Your Beautiful round out the top five among the pop-coded titles. If we zero in on pop fans, here are their top five pop-coded titles, uh, almost identical list. Uh, Girls Like You creeps in at number five. Next, we'll take a look at dance electronic. Among dance electronic fans, you see that genre accounts for 20% of the top 100 titles. So it's a smaller number than you've seen on the previous pages, but it's again about a two to one or exactly a two to one over performance of the genre among its core fans. So that's the common thread there. There's just fewer of those titles tested. Um, you see a lot of pop 
material among the best testing music with dance electronic fans. Um, and then behind that, some hip hop and R&B and some alternative rock, but no country. What are the top titles that are coded as dance electronic? The Middle, Let Me Love You, Something Just Like This, Closer, and Stay. And then if we zero in on dance electronic fans, here are their top five uh, from this genre. Again, a lot of similarity, a couple differences. Uh, 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 you see body come in, for example, um, but a lot of similarity generally between these two lists as you, as you look at the full, full list. Alternative rock material, if we look at fans of alternative rock, that genre is 20% of their top 100. Again, because it's a smaller category, you're not going to get a lot of depth there. That's, again, roughly two to one overperformance like we've seen in the other genres. And then interesting to see a lot of pop, again, come through among these fans. At this point in time, uh, the alternative rock appetite is, uh, you know, got a lot of parallels with pop and you see a lot of pop material come in there. Secondarily, some hip hop and R&B and some dance electronic, similar to the last slide. What are the top titles that are coded as alternative rock? Uh, Believer, Africa, Shut Up and Dance, Feel It Still, High Hopes. So this is another list you could look at and say, boy, that, that feels pretty crossover, pretty poppy. Uh, but those are the mass appeal titles from this genre. Um, among fans of this genre, several of the same titles and note that two of these are uh, covers zombie and africa last category we'll look at is latin among fans of latin music uh, 17 percent of titles are coded as latin again that roughly two to one over performance and then what else do they like surprise Pop, a lot of pop comes in uh, with the top 100 titles among Latin fans, and then some hip hop, some dance, even a little alternative. Here are the top five titles that are coded as Latin material, and then among Latin fans, here are the top five titles. John, I'm going to share some of the findings by demographic now, uh, you know, gender, age, ethnicity, and geography. And I'm going to start by looking at some of the differences between male and female evaluation scores, men in blue and, and women in, in red, as you see on your screen. Pop, of course, in the center of your screen, the common thread, uh, both genders with a large percentage of pop in their top 100. But note, that men have very little country titles in their top 100 best testing songs, only 8%. And alternative rock does not represent a large percentage of the top 100 among men. Maybe it did if we had done this study uh, years ago, we would have seen that, but not today. And if I move to take a look at some of the uh, findings among younger and older participants, younger defined as 12 to 34 in blue on your screen, and older 35 to 54 in red, beyond pop, which of course is the common thread again, note that hip hop and R&B represents a large component of the top 100 among 12 to 34 year olds, 35%, more than a third, but there is no country among the younger participants, only 1%, one song out of the top 100, for 12 to 34 year olds is country. Whereas among the 35 to 44 year olds in red, we see an equal per, percentage of country and pop, each 37% in their top 100, but very little, only 7%, hip hop and R&B. If I take a look at our findings by ethnicity, I'm gonna bring in blacks and blue, Hispanics and others, including Caucasian, Asians, and others. Note that for hip hop, represents 63% of the top, hip hop R&B represents 63% of the top 100 among black consumers with very little country or other sounds represented in their top 100. Among Hispanics in gray, about a quarter of the best-setting songs among Hispanics, hip hop and R&B, 
a very small percentage of country. And all the way over on the right, you see that that's when Latin um, finds its way into the top 100, 14% of the top titles among Hispanic consumers. And in red, the others predominantly pop, 37%. But a very large percentage of country as well, 28%, and 11% hip hop and R&B in their top 100. We also broke the findings geographically. So we asked people to tell us whether they lived in an urban area, a suburban area, or a rural area. And you'll note some differences here too. Among urban consumers, well, we have agreement in the center around pop. Uh, across areas of, 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 of living, right, geography. Uh, but 25% of the uh, top titles among urban consumers are hip hop, R&B. Only 7% country. And you do see some dance electronic coming into the top 100 uh, among urban consumers. Suburbanites, well, they have about the equal percentage of country and pop in their top 100. Um, I, I'm sorry, I said that improperly. Uh, suburban consumers have a good deal of pop, but only 13% country in, in their top 100 and 20% and hip hop and R&B. It's the rural consumers in red that have equal amounts of pop, 35%, and country at 36% in their top 100 with very little hip hop and R&B. And finally, we broke the data between the United States participants and the Canadian participants. And what you'll see here is that there's agreement again in the center on pop, about 40% of the top 100 in both countries is pop. Whereas in Canada, there is far less hip hop R&B in the top 100, only 8%, a hair more country, but also you see some dance electronic and alternative rock coming into the top 100 at a higher level among Canadians. Let me flip over now to uh, our view of the findings by consumption. And I wanna start with heavy and light music purchasers. So people told us that they were heavy music purchasers. They're gonna come in in blue, the light music purchasers in red. And, and, and the interesting difference is, is that heavy music purchasers beyond pop have a large percentage of hip hop and R&B within their top 100, very little, only 5% country, whereas light music purchasers have a higher percentage of country, 25%, and a bit less hip hop and R&B. And what we think this tells us is when you're looking at uh, sales data, Maybe now you understand why you're seeing a large percentage of hip hop in sales data and far less country titles within those sorts of rankers. Also, we looked at the data among uh, daily streamers as compared to daily radio users. Daily streamers and daily radio users both have a good deal of pop in their top 100, but the streamers have a good percentage of hip hop and R&B, 28%, and very little country, only 4%. Whereas the daily radio users have a good percentage of country and hip hop and R&B within their top 100, but not, but not at the highest of level. Also, we looked at the data among daily smart speaker streaming listeners. And you can see that for now, at least, um, as this sector develops, the top 100 among daily smart speaker streaming listeners doesn't look that much different than the overall data that John Boyne shared with you um, earlier in the presentation. And lastly, we broke the data by people who prefer Spotify, Pandora preference listeners, and YouTube preference listeners. So let me start with Spotify, bring that data in in blue, followed by Pandora in gray and YouTube in red. You'll note there's general agreement around pop. However, the Spotify preference listeners 
have uh, a good deal of hip hop and R&B within their top 100, almost no country, only 1%, and some of the other styles, dance, electronic, and alternative rock. Whereas those who prefer Pandora have more country, 39%, than pop within their top 100 titles. Still some hip hop and, and R&B and little bits of some of the other styles. And YouTube preference listeners in red, agreement on pop, and then somewhat of a balance between country and hip hop and R&B within, within their top 100 titles. So just a reminder, if you have questions along the way, please type them into the GoToMeeting software, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. So we've looked at a lot of kind of macro level findings on this contemporary music super study, and we've also shown you title performance, but limited, limited that to particular genres. Let's now look at the overall top testing titles. So what is the top song, the number one most positively evaluated song of the contemporary music super study? It is Uptown Funk by Mark Ronson and Bruno Mars. Now, let's also dig a little deeper. Let me show you the top 10. You'll see uh, no surprise, given what we've already shown you, uh, a definite pop lean to this material. Number two, Believer by Imagine Dragons. Number three, Shape of You by Ed Sheeran. Number four, Thinking Out Loud, also by Ed Sheeran. Number five, There's Nothing Holding Me Back, Shawn Mendes. Number six, Weezer's Cover of Africa. Number seven, Scars to Your Beautiful by Alessia Cara. Number eight, Havana. Number nine, 24 Karat Magic. And number 10, The Middle. Now, it wouldn't be a music test if we also didn't peek down to the very bottom of the ranker. What is the bottom song, the least positively evaluated, the least popular title of the contemporary music super study? That distinction goes to Gucci Gang by Little Pump, which also has the distinction of being the most highly burned title of all those tested. Now, um, let's have some fun. No, we did not test any songs by Donald Trump, and no, Donald Trump was not included in our sample of 1,000 consumers. But we did ask about Donald Trump. And we asked people uh, to give their opinion on uh, the United States president, and we then segmented the sample based on those who have a negative opinion of President Trump and those who have a positive opinion of President Trump. And wouldn't it be interesting to look at the titles and genres that tested well with both camps? So first, the top 100 titles among those who have a negative opinion of Trump, a lot of pop, and then a lot of hip hop and R&B, versus the top 100 titles of, among those who have a positive opinion of Trump, a lot of country, then pop, very little hip hop and R&B. So some very strong differences um, between the best testing lists uh, 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 from these two camps. There's a common thread, of course, of pop, as there are with, with many of the, the, the slides we've broken out for you today. But look at that hip hop and R&B versus country difference uh, uh, between those who have a negative opinion of the president and those who have a positive opinion of him. Now, let's go further. What's the number one song with Trump supporters? And what's the number one song with Trump detractors? So this is where it gets interesting. Although these two camps have very different macro level tastes, we've got some good news. There is a great unifier in these divided times, the same title is number one with both groups and the great unifier is uptown funk by bart Bronson and bruno mars 
So on that note, we're going to wrap up uh, our presentation portion of the webinar today. We hope that uh, you found a lot of this information to be intriguing and challenging and interesting. Um, you will be able to learn more about the results of our study by visiting our website at ColemanInsights.com. And we have been blogging over the last four Tuesdays in our regular Tuesdays with Coleman blog, uh, sharing with uh, our readers some additional insights from this study. Uh, we encourage you to visit our site and sign up for Tuesdays with Coleman. It is a free blog that you are emailed each Tuesday, and it has some really valuable and useful insights that we love sharing with our clients and others who are interested in the content that we share. So to wrap up our webinar today, we've seen that a couple of questions have come through the GoToMeeting software. We probably still have about a minute where if you have some questions that you want to ask, you can type them in. We may not be able to get to all of them, uh, but I'm going to uh, ask my colleague uh, Jay Nackless to share with us a question, and John, Sam, and I will tackle it. Okay, sure, guys. Uh, the first question we have uh, is, does any of this data explain why uh, music testing for radio stations results and the streaming charts um, can often look so different. Yeah, I think uh, we definitely see that in a couple of places in our study. Um, you know, the first thing that we always like to tell people is that when you're looking at streaming data, all you're really looking at are the people who like a song. You're not really seeing any data about people who don't like a song because much of streaming data is driven by you know the whole on-demand dimension of it so that's why you're going to see a difference between that and music testing results where we're getting data from people who love and hate songs at the same time um, the other thing that we definitely see though is as uh, uh, sam showed us a little bit earlier people who are daily streamers seem to demonstrate a much stronger appetite for hip hop and R&B, for example, whereas people who are daily radio listeners tend to demonstrate a much bigger appetite for country. Um, and that's why I think music testing remains very important and relevant, even as we have all these other sources about consumer music tastes, including streaming data. Streaming data can be very valuable in making music decisions at radio stations, but it needs to be used in concert with the kind of data that we're sharing here today that come from music tests. All right, so this one just came in um, and it relates to streaming also. It's, uh, do you see any correlation uh, that can be shown to have causation between songs not getting radio play in a market, but getting more streaming activity and vice versa? Or is looking at radio versus streaming not supported by enough usable behavioral data? Hmm. John, any thoughts? Putting you on the spot. Or Sam? Well, I mean, I, not to repeat what Warren just went through about some of the reasons why you do generally see differences between, say, a streaming chart and a radio chart. Um, I mean, just the, there are titles that uh, uh, kind of may, may fall outside of the, the testing patterns and testing history uh, and even airplay. Uh, with a radio station, but that doesn't mean they're not being consumed. So I always encourage clients, even if they uh, never played a song, to keep their eyes and ears open for titles that might work for them that develop through other avenues, whether it's streaming or uh, TV show exposure, commercials, or you, you name it, because things change and people move in and out of markets. And so um, I do generally think that uh, there will be titles that crop up that, that you you don't see on radio. And you know what? Some of them earn spots on radio as a result. Um, next question has to do with country music. And what's your take on um, why so few country songs were in the top 100 with younger listeners? Yeah, that one was uh, pretty uh, striking to us. Uh, for those who may not recall the specific chart that uh, Sam sh shared earlier, um, only 1% of the top 100 songs with the younger listeners in our study were country-coded titles, uh, yet there was plenty of country in the top 100 with the older half of the sample. Um, you know, that was a little challenging for us because, you know, we do a lot of research for country stations and, you know, we still see a, a, a solid, healthy appetite for the country format with younger listeners. 
Um, however, this data suggests that there aren't a lot of individual titles from country that are generating a lot of excitement with younger listeners, and you know that speaks to the need for uh, the country format to really pay attention to maintaining a high level of engagement with younger listeners, because if that trend would continue, if there weren't a lot of new or contemporary songs from the genre that appealed to younger listeners, that would not bode well for the long-term health of the format. It may be contextual as well, in that they, they may very well, the younger listeners may very well love some of these country titles, but they love these other songs at a higher level in comparison to pop, for example, or hip hop, it just, it just doesn't carry the same weight. Yeah, it's a great point, Sam. Uh, there's one more question to cover here, but <laughs> one isn't a question. It's just a statement uh, or a question. Uh, Mars Ronson 2020. <laughs> it would certainly unify us, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> apparently. Uh, last question here, or at least next question, is uh, what's your take that so many of the songs uh, consumed were before 2018? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, and it's one that we're going to need a little more historical context as we hopefully replicate this study in future years. You know, it's why we stressed this is a contemporary music study and not a new music study. Um, you know, roughly half the titles that were the most consumed songs in 2018, whether it was by radio, airplay, streaming, or sales, were from before 2018. Um, we don't know. There's not enough history to tell us yet um, whether that is a low number or a high number. Our gut instinct says that it might demonstrate a relatively low level of enthusiasm about new music right now. And there certainly are other things we've seen, particularly in the CHR format and in the pop realm that would suggest that is the case. But that is something that we're going to need to see as we replicate this study in future years, whether the you know consumers are consuming a larger or smaller percentage of their, their most consumed songs from the year that they're released. All right, and it looks like that is all the questions we have for now. Excellent, well, great. Well, we thank you all for attending. Um, again, please visit us at ColemanInsights.com, sign up for the Tuesdays with Coleman blog, and uh, we will be releasing some additional insights from this study over the next couple of weeks. So uh, your best way to stay on top of that is to be connected to our website, our blog, and also on our various social media channels. So on behalf of Jay Nackless, Sam Milkman, and John Boyne, I'm Warren Kurtzman. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.